Today, we're going to speedrun installing five different operating systems that are obscure enough that I'm pretty sure that only a handful of live have ever seen them before now. As always, this is your host, End Commander, and today, all of you get to feast on my pain. Starting off our list at number five, did you know that Dell used to make its own version of Unix? Well, now you do. Let's get to installing. After using the boot and system disks to start, we get a selection of ways to install Dell Unix, with the first one being from tape. This should be unsurprising since Dell Unix was first released somewhere around 1990 and retired by 1992. CD-ROM drives were still years from becoming standard equipment. Unfortunately, neither 86box nor any other emulator that I'm aware of has support for a tape drive, ruling the easy option out. Network installation might have been possible, but the iNet disk required to do this has been lost to time. So with no other options left, I selected to use a floppy based install. A few easy partition screens later, and I was prompted to insert disk zero of 31. Yes, zero. You have to wonder how many support calls that caused. Also, I will say that loading floppies like this is one of the more mind numbing things you can do. Although once you get into it, there's bit of a zen to this sort of thing. That being said, I'm pretty sure for all of you, watching paint dry is more interesting than sitting at these series of prompts. Fortunately, with the power of video editing, we can fast forward to the end result. After 32 discs and several documentaries on the other screen later, I was greeted with this prompt, asking if I want to install additional software. If you're foolhardy enough to type one here, you get this oh so wonderful prompt. Insert disk zero out of 43. <sighs> I also hope that anyone foolhardy enough to attempt this will give it more than 200 megabytes of disk space since, as it turns out, the installer doesn't actually bother to check if you have enough free disk space before beginning. As I found out, much to my annoyance, on the 43rd and final disk of the set, the installer printed out ominous disk full messages and then aired out not too long after. I was kinda screaming on the inside at this point. When I finally worked up the strength to continue this, I was initially determined to use a tape-based method simply so I didn't need to babysit it again. This should be theoretically possible through what I could best describe as tactical use of DD. However, I was eventually forced to concede defeat since despite having read accounts of others who have successfully done this, no matter what I tried to do, CPIO would constantly error out trying to extract the data. It's a mystery for another day, I suppose. As a consolation prize, I did find what appears to be the epitaph of some poor lost soul lamenting that they allowed users to search. F to that nameless engineer, you are not forgotten. Anyway, having been thwarted from completing a floppyless install, I queued up more YouTube documentaries and got to installing. After the third or fourth one, I finally reached the network configuration and time zone set, followed by the first boot. This would be largely unremarkable except for these lines saying that DAWs 5 is being installed. Dell Unix likely includes some DAWs compatibility layer like Merge. I didn't test this, but these types of products were fairly common, with even Linux distributions like Soft Landing Linux including DAWs MU out of the box. After that excitement, we're greeted with a welcome to Dell Unix screen, told to set the root password, and then immediately thrown into OAM or the Operations Administration and Maintenance tool. I'm just going to say it's one of the more awkward vendor tools that I've had the pleasure of dealing with. After escaping menuing hell, I'm prompted to do the final configuration and then are thrown to a shell prompt. Hooray, we're done. I did start up X, but I was stuck in 640x480 mode and the mouse was having issues. I did fiddle with the configs for a while before giving it up as a lost cause. This has been a neat trip, and there's been enough here that maybe at some point in the future I'll come back or at least investigate the topic of x86 Unix as a whole. There's enough weirdness to go around here. Coming up number 4 on our list is Windows Fundamentals for Legacy PCs. 
This wasn't a version of Windows that was ever sold in stores, and instead it was exclusively released to customers of Microsoft's software assurance program in an effort to try and get the last holdouts of NT4 and 98 to move into the then current year of 2006. It was also marketed as a way to reuse older hardware as Finn clients using remote desktop protocol. Under the hood, Fundamentals for Legacy PCs is actually a rebranded and slightly retooled version of Windows XP for embedded devices. I've talked about the embedded editions of Windows before, but they are stripped down version of Windows designed to be used on resource constrained machines. Furthermore, this was the last major release from the XP codebase. Vista would release the same year and Fundamentals for Legacy PCs has very Visca-esque branding intermixed with the XP Luna theme throughout. I initially tried to run Fundamentals on UTM, a virtualization and emulation front end for QMU on macOS, but I had limited success. Finding a configuration that simply didn't have a blue screen on startup was tricky, and even when I found one, I didn't have a functional mouse. In the end, I did manage to get it to work on 86 box, and true to the type of machine Fundamentals was meant for, it's emulating a 233 megahertz Intel Celeron processor. The first stage installation finished relatively quickly, followed by something else unique, the first boot agent. This is where the bulk of the installation time went. Based on the messages displayed, I get the sense that this is reconfiguring Windows XP and redoing hardware detection, similar to what happens after running sysprep on a retail version. After quite a while, I'm prompted to hit Control alt delete and sign in. After logging in, we can see just how little is actually here. In keeping with its name, Fundamentals, even when selecting to do a full install, removes many bits and pieces from Windows such as fast user switching in an effort to remove unnecessary bloat. We can also see that even with a complete install, very little is actually present in the start menu. These missing components are known to cause compatibility issues. For example, SciGen will not run on Windows Fundamentals due to the lack of a null device. Fundamentals would ultimately be replaced with Windows Fin PC, and this entry of weird version of Windows would disappear into the history books. About the most I can say is I wish I thought to run this on the Sun PCI. It probably would have been usable as compared to XP proper. Number three on our list was officially called macOS X Server 1.0. What it should actually have been called is Next Step for Power of PC with the platinum look and feel from classic macOS. It could also be more accurately called, we need a server S, so we're going to ship the one we just bought from Next. If you're familiar with Next Step, it's pretty easy to see where Apple simply filed off the serial numbers. Trying to get this to install was an exercise in frustration and took the better part of two days until I got a result that I considered good enough. If you're mad enough to try and replicate this feat, QMU is able to run this early version of OS X, but I believe the words sensitive to initial conditions aptly sum up the experience. I also had some serious problem with QMU's Coca render cropping off the top of VMs. I did work around this by recompiling QMU to use SDL instead, but some of the footage got mangled. The process begins by loading up classic macOS and using the disk setup utility to partition the hard drive using the macOS server UFS profile. This is then followed by running the install macOS 10 server application from the server CD. Not doing this step will cause macOS 10 server to complain that there are no hard drives present. You'll receive a warning about the NVRAM that you can ignore, and then you need to reconfigure QMU's machine type to be a beige PowerMac G3 since it actually does matter. Once at the zero prompt, you can type the correct arcane runes to start macOS 10 off the CD. This would also be a good time to prepare a pot of coffee since you're going to be waiting a while. Next step, as well as the early versions of macOS 10 proper, were rather notorious for being slow but server 1.0 takes it a step further. Instead of Quartz, which is the modern macOS X rendering engine, Apple shipped what was very clearly an unoptimized port of Display PostScript. This combined with a hastily done port to PowerPC means that your PowerMac G3 
likely felt on par with a 25 megahertz next station instead. Anyway, at this point, if you did everything properly, Mac OS X Server 1.0 will start up and automatically copy the files to the hard drive, followed by another reboot. After waiting through the startup prompts, I was presented with Setup Assistant, which takes us through the basics of machine configuration, user creation, and network configuration. After finishing all these prompts, I was prompted to reboot for the final time. This was followed by what can only be described as excessive thumb twiddling as I waited for the first boot to complete. After logging as root, I found that I had plenty of time to run to the store and back as server 1.0 grinded away in the background. When I checked the video footage in Resolve later, it had taken 13 minutes from the login screen to the desktop, with a full cold boot taking over 30. I hope you're patient if this becomes your next retro computing project. Once logged in, I found that the system was kinda usable, but the mouse proved to be a bit glitchy. Still, I made it to the desktop, so I'm calling that a win. Coming up number two on our list, let me introduce you all to Sprite, running on an emulated DexStation 5000 powered by GXMUL. While most people know Sprite as a soft drink, Sprite, the operating system, was an attempt to make a more network-aware operating system at the University of California, Berkeley in the 1980s. Instead of having an individual computer have a full copy of the operating system, programs, and other data files, Sprite was designed on the idea of having a network file system and later having the network be an extension of the operating system itself. These weren't exactly new ideas even at the time and several vendors, rather notably Sun Microsystems, would take the idea of a networked file system mainstream, but Sprite was unique that it also allowed processes to migrate seamlessly from machine to machine. In effect, a network of machines running Sprite were much more akin to a modern day cluster or grid computing setup. For those familiar with virtualization, much of what Sprite was pioneering is conceptually similar to modern day live migration solutions like VMware's vMotion, albeit on a much smaller scale. Unfortunately, Sprite hasn't done well in preservation. What I'm running is a disk dump of what essentially is a demonstration system, which is missing many of the components that made Sprite interesting. Even trying to show off X was difficult since GXMEL stopped responding to mouse inputs not long after starting it up. Under the hood, Sprite provides a Unix-like environment on top of a custom non-AT&T kernel and the available disk images have a large assortment of utilities that come from the then current versions of BSD, as well as many tools from the Free Software Foundation. That said, without its unique networking bits, there isn't much to show and I'm kinda disappointed by that. A lot of that is due to the fact that more and more pieces of computer history are being lost bit by bit every day, but I'll talk about that more later. Had Sprite existed in a more complete form, I could have potentially shown the hot migration of slow running tasks from machine to machine. However, as something of a silver lining, it does appear that most of Sprite's source code has survived and rather notably, they appear to have used GCC as a compiler. That means, at least theoretically, it might be possible to build a more complete Sprite image from source. That, however, is a project for another day. Now, before we get to our number one and probably the main reason you clicked on this video, we're going to cover a bonus operating system mostly because I didn't know that the last emulator I needed could be compiled on Linux, and I thought this would be a perfectly good time to try Windows for ARM64, since it's supposed to run x64 software seamlessly. What I didn't expect, but probably should have, was a heaping dumpster fire. If you're like me and prefer a fresh install of Windows from an ISO, or as we'll later see, have issues with the official VHDX hard drive images, Let's start with the fact that there are no official ISOs for Windows ARM64 available. Unofficial ones can be built with third-party tools, but uh, they have issues. For science, I actually tried one of these unofficial images out, created with a tool on macOS called Crystal Fetch. Surprisingly, the image will start, but after a few screens, kneel over and die because my MacBook Pro isn't ready for Windows 11. If you find yourself in this situation, you can press Shift F10 to open a terminal window and then the registry adder. Here, you can add two keys to bypass the TPM and secure boot checks. 
This, of course, isn't where the story ends, since about five minutes later, the installation failed. Why did it fail? Because the WIM file is corrupt, likely due to the fact that you have to piecemeal an installation ISO with an unofficial tool. Ugh. Now, you might be wondering why I wanted to go with an unofficial ISO at all. Well, it's because the pre-installed VHDX images have problems. Officially, they're intended for use on Microsoft's Hyper-V hypervisor and not third-party hypervisors like I'm using here. This is immediately evident as the system starts up in a failsafe resolution and made much more obvious once the out-of-the-box experience begins running. Loading up the pre-installed image goes promising at first, with the system immediately starting to boot. This happy, good feeling lasts right up until Windows demands that we connect to the internet and the installer soft locks. This is because Microsoft's pre-made VDHDX doesn't include the necessary Ethernet drivers as required by UTM. There is also no way to install the drivers at this point in time. To get around this, what you actually need to do is hit Shift F10 at the right point in the start sequence to open a terminal prompt. Here you can run the command Bypass NRO. This restarts the out-of-the-box experience and, more importantly, adds a new option that allows you to skip setting up the network and proceed to creating a local user account. Assuming you did everything right, you should make it to the desktop. If you're the poor SOB who is making these videos, you'll then first experience Windows complaining that you're running an expired build, then crash, and then take the entire blasted file system on the way out. No, I'm not kidding, this actually happened. I made sure to update UTM, macOS, and pretty much everything else I could think of, and after a few false starts, I actually did get Windows 11 to not only successfully install, but even get guest editions installed as well. So yeah, Windows 11 on ARM, a wonderful experience that I can wholly recommend if you want some modern pain and suffering. That brings us to the last item on our list, the operating system that powered supercomputers, COS short for Cray Operating System. For this one, I'm gonna give a fair bit more context for, mostly because the story here is so unique, I think it deserves to be shared. Let's start with Cray. Even if you don't know the name, you've probably seen their machines. They were some of the most iconic computers of the 70s and 80s, and have long entered the public consciousness as the idea of what a supercomputer should look like. Cray supercomputers powered the heart and science of industry for decades, they were, quite literally, some of the most powerful computers in the world on the planet when they were new, and many served in decades in operation. Today though, they are essentially extinct. While the physical chassis and technical documentation still exist, the actual software had nearly been lost to time. Several efforts to build an emulator for the Cray 1, or any Cray machine, were stymied by the fact that there were no surviving copies of the Cray operating system or any related software. That is until a guy named Chris Fenton managed to track down a data pack from a former Cray engineer. In a truly impressive feat of data recovery, Chris was able to partially revive an ancient CDC 9677 disk drive and take a magnetic dump of the disk contents. This miracle of data recovery allowed another guy, Andreas Tantus, to create a functional Cray XMP emulator. Tantus has documented the full story on his blog, Modular Circuits, and it's a rather impressive feat of reverse engineering, tenacity, and more. I have linked both blogs in the description, and I highly recommend reading the full story. I'm just happy to bring attention to the project and the larger problem of computer history being lost to the ages. This is a good time to bring up if you or someone you might know have items that are likely to become lost, like specialty operating systems, productivity software, or more, now might be a good time to back them up and perhaps contribute an article to the Restless Systems Wiki. We have an active Discord community and more with links in the description and contributions to the channel like Patreon and Coffee go towards hosting and operation costs and for creating more videos like this. Anyway, with that said, let's get this show on the road. When you first start up the Cray MP emulator, a lot of things happen at once. Besides the emulator status window, three separate terminal windows pop up at the same time. Unlike more conventional CPU architectures, the Cray XMP uses independent secondary processors to bring up the system, known as I.O. processors or I.O.P.s. The best analogy I can come up with is that these are somewhat akin to the diagnostic system in a modern car. 
all four IOPs are identical in terms of hardware, but run different software and regulate different aspects of the Cray mainframe. At this point, the IOPs have come out of reset, but the main mainframe processor is still idling. These three windows correspond to the three displays, as seen on the block diagram. At this point, we need to use the MIOP or IOP0 window to bring the Cray system out of reset. Since we're starting from a blank slate, we need to install COS to the emulated DD29 hard drive. We can do this with the start command that loads COS and the install parameter file into memory. We get a few prompts as the IOP copies COS into the mainframe CPU memory space and then brings it out of reset. We now have a running supercomputer. Next, we need to bring up a station, which is Cray speak for a terminal, and is done with the aptly named station command. Immediately afterwards, a new window opens. Here, we can log on to the system and start interacting with it. Here's where we get to one of the big things about mainframes. They're largely used to do batch processing, so most of the user interaction is handled through starting jobs, responding to system inquiries, and getting status messages. Interactive use, while possible, was generally rare. Instead, we're taking on the role of a system operator who has to monitor and control all aspects of the system. One major aspect of this is reviewing and replying to station messages. We can see station messages by typing STMSG. There's one waiting. Enter configuration changes or go to continue. We don't have any configuration changes to make, so we can use the reply command to send the go message. After a few moments, a new message appears telling us that install will be performed and the disk data will be destroyed. We tell it to go ahead with another reply. From here, we can switch to viewing the station information messages and following the install progress in real time. After several minutes, we're prompted with the words start complete. Neat. Now what? Well, future startups can be done via the dead start process, which has the added advantage of not wiping out the hard drive. However, as it is now, we're essentially running on a skeletal system with just the bare necessities to start costs. If we want to do anything, we need to submit some jobs. What are jobs, you might ask? Well, jobs are mostly mainframe speak for running a script or batch file, and despite looking very different from a batch script, it's mostly just syntax differences since jobs are coded in the job control language or JCL. So let's run one, shall we? First, we need to enable all job classes and set a limit on how many jobs we can run at once. We can then submit JTest30 to run and monitor it on the status screen. It'll run for a bit and then exit. So what did it do? Well, not much. Job output results on this Cray system got directed to a physical printer which the Cray emulator sends to a file. If we open that file, we can see a bunch of JCL statements with the job ultimately erroring out due to a missing data set. Unfortunately, the sad truth is while Chris Fenton's awesome data recovery matches save a copy of costs, the actual compilers and utilities for it have been lost to time. There's a job known as jinstall, which is supposed to restore the system from a tape backup. I can submit it, but the system simply pauses waiting for said tape to be inserted. Without the backup tape, there's very little you can actually do. So, rip. It is possible to run Unicos, a port of Unix to the Cray architecture, but that's a project for another day. Of the jobs on the system, the only one that sorta of does anything is JGenCat, which generates a backup catalog. This one actually launches a subjob and issues a system message, which is at least something. Before we finish up though, I might as well demo interactive logins and interactive jobs. To allow for interactive logins, we need to issue commands to the IOP console to enable it. We then can use the IAC command on our station window to start an interactive session. At this point, we can issue login to attach to costs. This is then followed by account and a crazy number of switches to provide our username, login, and accounting group. After which, we can then issue a fetch command to load the TEDI text adder. Also, as a seemingly irrelevant aside, if you've ever wondered why the DD utilities on macOS and Linux have such a hard syntax, you have met the inspiration, and that inspiration is JCL. At this point, I think I've covered enough of the basics, and if you want to see more, Andreas Tantos has a YouTube channel with a few videos on costs. A link will be in the cards and in the description. 
With that, it's time to come to a close. Leave a comment if you can think of something I didn't cover or point out, and subscribe if you want to see more. If you want to make sure I can still make more content like this, please consider contributing on Ko-fi or Patreon. Until next time, this is N Commander signing out and wishing you all a good day.